But it's a great pleasure to be part of this conversation and, um, you know, I'm loving it. I'm very, very much enjoying interacting with and listening to the range of ideas that are being shared. Um, Jane asked me for a title some time ago and I thought, well, well, I came up with this, the message for clients, take ownership of your career, have a better time, build a better world. And since giving that to Jane, I felt obligated to wrap some conversation around those ideas. Um, ah, so he's from the USA, right? And he's got this guy to deal with. Guess what? You've got this guy to deal with. Can we talk? I love the title of this conference. You know what Janet said, it kind of in my sweet spot. Um, I was glad to hear the boundaryless career celebrated as an oxymoron the other day. You know, along with planned happenstance and other eye-catching notions. And I, I felt good about that because it was a term of convenience. The Academy of Management had a, simple, had a, a theme on the boundaryless organization back in 1993. So the title was given to us. We had to put in a symposium about the boundaryless career. And I'm glad that some of its longevity is, is attributable to the oxymoronic nature of the term. Anyway, we won't be talking about boundaryless careers today. Wow, I love the conference title. So this is me, born and raised in Hartlepool. Home of Andy Cap, the cartoon character. Who remembers him? Home of Brian London, who went 15 rounds with Muhammad Ali. Who remembers Brian London? Not so many, huh? So this is the blue collar history of the town and you know, it became the unemployment capital of Britain in the 1960s when everything that Hartlepool had built up from the fishing port to the shipbuilding to the docklands to the steelworks all the good masculine jobs that Andy Capp's culture depended on suddenly vanished, you know. And all the way up the northeast coast, as you probably well know, all industrial land is now apartments and marinas. But I grew up before that happened. My last act as a student in this country was to complete a PhD at Cranfield Business School. School of Management, it's called. Um, I was on a jamboree in, in Belgium where there was a group of European PhD scholars on a Ford Foundation um, activity and, and a Canadian professor volunteered to write to Canadian schools saying this guy was looking to, you know, travel while he was finishing his PhD. So I went off to Canada and somewhere along the way, I realized that a PhD in management was attractive because this thing called accreditation was going on. And they didn't really care whether it was a British or an American PhD. You know, and I found myself attractive to American schools and ended up at Suffolk University in Boston with a very slight itch in the back of my head that I'd been reading work by Edgar Schein and some of his collaborators. And MIT was in Boston and that might be useful. Um, and I got adopted when I went over there. I didn't know a soul, but for some reason, you know, people decided to put up with me and work with me. And so within 10 years of going over there, I was editing the Handbook of Career Theory. Then I turned on a dime because I started, I came to Warwick and I was asked to sort of do the literature research on, a, on HRM in small to medium firms. And they said, and look at Europe and look at Japan. And along the way, I came across mobility figures that said that the average employment period in the US was five years. 
average employment period in the UK was six years. I read a statistic and used it that said the average employment period of the Japanese male was eight years. I think that may have been because they forgot to adjust for the jobs that were still in progress. You know, they didn't nip off the last job in the sequence. But it was still, you'd end up with saying it was 10 or 12 years, even if you corrected for that. And I said, well, you know, we're studying organizational careers. We're missing out on almost everything that's interesting. Most people have four or five jobs in a lifetime, often more. And here we are pretending that that mobility is unimportant. So I turned on a dime and, and offered this boundaryless career book in uh, 1996. And the intelligent career is a spin-off from that. It's, if you will, my own contribution to this larger conversation about the boundaryless career. Today, I, 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 you know, I give talks. I'm still active in, in reviewing papers. I have a couple of projects going on that Janet spoke about. The ICCS career exploration system is my contribution in terms of how to bring these ideas into practice. And Janet Sheath is uh, the principal uh, trainer and, and active career consultant in that world. One of my books, uh, the Intelligent Career book, which came out 2017, 2018 in paperback. By the way, I've got a few copies left. Please don't make me take them home. $12 a head is a bargain, and I will sign them, OK? Um, and uh, one copy landed on the, deck of, uh, on the desk of the Forbes editorial office, and a woman called me and said, well, would you like to write for Forbes.com? And I am far from alone in that activity, and there's a very wide slew of, of stuff up there, and they're trying very hard to reach a younger audience. But I, I write stuff once or twice a week, and I'm up to maybe 40 articles on there so far. And it's taken me in some interesting directions, which you can maybe talk about later. So here's our title, Take Ownership of Your Career. Sorry, a message for clients in the first segment, Take Ownership of Your Career. And this is someone who I find absolutely fascinating. He's in the book. His name is Jean-Luc Bre, And he joined Polydor Records as an entry-level advertising worker, you know, calling up people and selling space and so on. Um, and he was an absolute naif, you know. He got this clerical job at the bottom of his field. But he starts to have ideas, and he's watching the industry change around him. It was vinyl when he started, and he started to see the unfolding nature of the industry. And he started to go to his bosses. And the first time around his bosses, he said, you know, I've got this idea about how we can better connect with how we can merchandise the music. One, one cycle was, was selling musical credit cards to the banks, so you have your identify with your music. That's just sort of typical. Lots of stuff about the record company becoming the agent for their performers and so on and so forth. All kinds of things. So he goes to his bosses and he says, look, I've got this idea. And he's careful about how much he lets, lets out. He doesn't want them to think anyone can do it. And they say, OK, go ahead, John Luke, you know. And so he, he's, he's invited to do this project. And he recruits people from inside. And he's working with clients from outside. And he's got, you know, two or three years to complete this project. But he started to make a habit of this. And he says, you know, it's like cycling. He said, you you know, it's fine as long as you don't fall off. He said, sometimes you can be going in the wrong direction, but keep cycling and it'll work out, you know. And he said, I want no set career plan. But he stayed in the same company. It's what makes him really interesting. He stayed in the same company for 30 years, one project at a time. And each time it was the same 
overall tactic. Go to his bosses with a fresh idea. Oh, yes, John Luke. Yeah, let's do that. And this series of three-year projects, each of which brought in new industry relationships and provided him with new learning. And it's just fascinating because, you know, you sort of scratch your head and say, well, is this an intelligent, is this, you know, what kind of career is this? How do we interpret it? Well, vocational guidance wouldn't get it. It would. It might have said, well, you're interested in music. You know, it might have pointed him in a direction. Organizational career stuff wouldn't have... I mean, we'd have been saying, well, there's this hierarchy you've got to climb, John Luke, you know. And the boundaryless career thing, I... It depends what perspective you brought. But if you thought a boundaryless career was a sort of disorganized thing, it wouldn't quite work. An intelligent career, career ownership? Maybe. And if we look at the intelligent career framework, the three underlying questions, why do you work, how do you work, with whom do you work? But what's interesting are the intersections between those three ways of knowing. The most recognizable are, of course, the the direction from why you work to how you work, which is this sort of rich territory of vocational guidance, right? You look inside someone's head and you tell them where they'll be suited to work. And 20 years ago, that was most of what we were about, right? And is how, how popular is the skills finder in this country? Right? And that's what that's about. You pick your five skills and it gives you five paragraphs that are plucked from a computer system that, you know, delivers those five paragraphs. On the other side, I mean, the vocational, the Holland stuff says, well, one of the ideas here is you start to work with your own kind of people. And there's a couple of variants of that, but there's the, there's the party exercise, which is, you know, you go there and you go here and you go here and out of those first three choices, you identify the people that you'd really like to work with. So, but, but both of those are looking from a, 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 percept, a, you know, a perspective on the person and trying to go from the person's identity or motivation into one of the other two corners. Business school professors, meanwhile, were looking at the situation quite differently, and they were saying jobs can be either motivating or demotivating. All right? So the business school professor is looking at quite the opposite relationship to the one that the vocational guidance prof is looking at. Yeah? Sociologists are out there telling us that much depends on the people we grow up with or work with and that reference groups very much shape how we see ourselves and the motivators that we respond to. So we've, again, we've got people looking in quite the opposite direction from the initial one. Group dynamics tells us that the group very much influences our individual performance. And if you don't go along with the group, you're a deviant, or even worse, you're an isolate, yeah? Oh, sorry. Leadership theory says quite the opposite. It says there are skills you can learn in order to lead, in order to lead your group. So leadership theory goes from how you work to with whom you work, right? So there's all this going on. And six bodies of work, at least, that are pointing to particular aspects of this model. What do you do with that? Well, I would say you ask the person. You know? Don't you want to hear how the person's making sense of all this? Isn't that the right starting point? Psychometricians would, you know, be horrified, right? Who's a psychometrician? But they don't like this, yeah? 
I mean, the, the psychometrician says, well, I love that, like, you can find the separate relationships. Well, what is this about them all being interdependent? How do I deal with that, right? Well, not everything is, can be solved through least squares analysis, you know. Sometimes this is the way the world looks and we've got to deal with it. Jean-Luc Bre, how does he fit this model? Well, step one, he has an idea, he goes to his bosses. Step two, he's encouraged by his bosses, he's motivated. Step three, he maps out the work. Step four, he recruits his team. Step five, the team is getting close to the end of the work. Step six, he realizes he's got to go back to his bosses and find a new project, right? But I mean, the point about this model is it's alive and it's getting, you know, stimulated by people's latest experience and these things can be going. It makes sense that you can meet someone and they can inspire you. It makes sense that you can do, be asked to do a new block of work and that might take you to meet a new customer or might inspire you to see your work situation differently and so on and so forth. So that's an example of taking ownership of your career, and I'd argue it can be applied pretty broadly uh, to other workers. Have a better time. This is Rachel Nelkin. Rachel Nelkin wrote an article for Guardian Professional in 2013. And I was looking for something and found it and she was sort of a typical graduate of a music school. What do you do after you get a music degree? Well, you teach and you, you've got your cello or your instrument and you try your luck at signing on with one of the big orchestras and you, you know, you make a living for a few years and then you say, well, this isn't quite working out the way I wanted to, so what do we do about it? Um, she went to Birkbeck, got an arts management diploma. She saw in the newspaper that an article that said the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra was doing community outreach, which at that time was unheard of. So she picked up the phone and said, I see you're doing this, can I volunteer to help you? And she told them a bit about her background. They said, oh yeah, that sounds fine, please come, and come down and see us. And that initiative was the turning point and next time around any prospective clients she could say well I'm doing this work with the Royal Philharmonic and blah 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 and she ended up at the time of the article she was half time with the Performing Rights Society with a new an initiative for new music that they were sponsoring um, she had a supportive husband she was a parent of young children by this stage and she was picking off other gigs to fit in with her family life and to build on what she'd started when she first saw the Royal Philharmonic advert. And you know she said in the article each area of work informs the other. The title was one step back and two steps forward. Yeah, I'm giving up this, but look at what I'm getting, you know? And she's still basically doing the same stuff. She's head of creative programs at Albany Theatre. She still keeps a youth music board appointment. She still works with Future Arts Centres and the Future Arts Centres initiative and cherry picks projects that fit in with the busy life that she, that she has. And I think she raises some really interesting questions. What do we think about freelancing? Michelle Obama is out there now saying freelancing is a must. Right? And she's saying that from a woman's point of view, but she's very much expecting that you know, men are going to join in and partners are going to join in and it's necessary in a family to look for freelancing work that allows you to complement your, your, 
your home situation. What is a job? I think Rachel Nelkin, when she wrote, she said something about, you know, can I make three part-time jobs as fulfilling and as workable as one full-time job? And she made it more workable. Um, Charles Handy's first mention of portfolio work was in 1989. The first commercial web browser and email service were not available until six years later. And I would argue that everything since that time has moved in favor of freelance work over, quote, regular jobs. What was his name? Uh, there was a guy who wrote about Karl Marx's revenge when the PC, you know, the idea was the means of production were now in your own home. You didn't have to go to the office to do what you needed to do. And, but the web and email and all of the, the services that are out there, some very, very good freelancer friendly job sites out there. Um, so I find it fascinating that we'd sort of read and enthused about and forgotten about Charles Handy pretty much by the time the web became a serious factor in our lives. And yet what you see going on around you now is very, very consistent with his writing. I think Rachel's story, and we've been talking about it quite a bit, this notion of chance. She picked up the paper. I suppose it comes from how you work and as much she was reading about her industry. So, but it, this sudden intervention said, look, you know, there's Royal Philharmonic doing this stuff. And she said, well, look, I'm trying to get myself into that world. And so she was motivated to call Royal Philharmonic and you can see how the connections flowed and, and suddenly she was off and on her way. Um, sense making, which I would argue this is very much a sense making framework and that's why all the three ways of knowing are interdependent. You can go around the triangle any way you want. From the beginning chance of, of reading about the British film, the, the Royal Philharmonic, Rachel was very much in this sense-making mode and looking around and picking up complementary work that suited her family situation. She says she was offered five full-time jobs. She said she applied for five full-time jobs and in three of them she persuaded the job offerer that she could do it part-time from home. And one of, her, one of her messages is, don't buy the argument that says you have to be full-time on site because it's not so. And you know the sense-making is evident, I think, when you read the story and see how the links go from one position to another which creates the narrative. So it seems to me that there's something about a chance event that, that gets this thing going. From that point we can follow up, we, we engage in sense making, the narrative unfolds and then we come to rely on that, or build on that narrative as we predictably go into the next cycle of activity. Build a better world. All of these examples are in my book by the way, but I love this guy, Moses Zulu. Grew up on a family farm, penniless, his only opportunity was to do his homework while he was out as the family goat herd. Right? He's sitting out there in a the barren field doing his homework while he's doing what he needs to do for his family. And there are about, I think there are three cut-off points in the Zambian school system. Four years, eight years, twelve years. 
So you have to do well in your own year because by the time you four years, you kind of expected to be college bound and not many Zambians get to be college bound. But somehow, he, by doing his homework in the field, he kept getting through and he eventually got to college and he became a health, a, a government employed health technologist. And then he got talking and I guess the chance thing was that there were two NGO workers assigned to his location. And he got talking with these two NGO workers about how they could help. Everyone was scared of AIDS. And it was a social phenomenon. It was, wasn't so much the disease itself, but people being scared about what was going on and, and why people were getting AIDS and what that meant for families and so on. So these, this guy and these two NGO workers, you know, designed a grant application and sent it off. And there was a pattern of this, and they kept sending it off to new potential donors. And by the time they were up to the 50th application, he'd lost both his friends, one to, one to kidney failure and one to cancer. So there he is on his own, recycling these applications. And one charitable institution, the Firelight Foundation in California, said, you know, Moses, this isn't very good, but if you'd like us to help you make it better, we will. And he said, oh, thank you. And they helped him and they gave him a small $2,000 grant and they said, well, let's see what you do with this and write back and tell us how you've spent the money. And he did that. And the Firelight Foundation adopted him and nursed him toward a US government new partnership initiative. And he's the CEO of the company that is the primary provider of HIV support in this particular province of one million people. And all that from being a family shepherd boy. I just think it's a lovely story, you know. He called me up, he said, my PhD thesis is ready for submission, but I'd need someone to look at it. I said, of course, you know. <laughs> I was so delighted to sort of help him out. And, and anyway, he got his PhD. So where is he going? We, oh, I just got wow on the bottom, that's why I put another slide there. So here we are, here's this model again, you know, is, is the, the buddies he was asked to work with, were the people that, that enabled him to get the conversation going. And then again, you can see how the sense making takes over and the narrative develops. But this is Moses' better world, you know. I'm arguing that the better world is a very individual thing. If you look at the way Moses' path has traveled and where he's been and how he's got here, this is his world. You know, and he supports his wife in her career and he's got four kids. And, but in this space, in this unique space that is Moses to fill, it's his contribution to a better world. And what I'd like to suggest is that we can generalize from that and think about how each of us or each of our clients can similarly be engaged with building a better world from their own unique situation. How am I doing for time? Oh, we're doing all right. So this is NYSEC. And I just find myself wondering, the first time you look at this, you say, you know, this is great. And you look at NYSEX and do all these things. But it's an institutionalizing kind of picture, isn't it? So I do find myself sort of saying, well, what about chance sense making and the narrative as they might be applied within and among NYSEX members? And I, I mean, I've enjoyed what I've heard the last day and a half. So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm happy with what I've been hearing. But it's an interesting question, don't you think? That, that the sort of the, the, the idea of a trade-off between institutionalizing and staying current. And if I were to 
nudge a little bit, I do worry about, you know, with the idea of a good job, and which came from the factory system, and for good reasons was applied to one career, that of the provider, right? In days when fishermen and, and, and you know, miners and factory workers did dangerous work and it made a lot of sense. There's, a, there's an American artist, Winslow Homer was up in my part of the world and he, he did this thing of the fisherwomen and they're all standing on the, on the shore and they're looking out to sea and the, the message is they're sort of hoping that their men come home but the kids will be all right if they don't, you know. And so women were the fabric of a society even though they didn't work in a formal sense. But that, you know, what, which was a highly appropriate concept of the time and a very appreciative one, we've left that behind. But we still seem to think that full-time work on eight-hour shifts is the only way to go or the preferred way to go. And it seems to me we're at risk of working with that model for too long when you look at the world of freelancing and what Michelle Obama is saying and I have to say I agree with her you know I, I, what is who in Richard Branson interviewed her I found a Richard Branson interview of Michelle Obama and very very nice summary of the way she thinks about the world and what she's suited for and how she works with her kids and etc etc very nice model um, but very much about living with and celebrating alternative approaches to work. So there you have it, the message for clients, three parts to that message. I'm ready for some conversation. Questions? And now we want to do this well, so let's, we've got the microphones, Janet, right? Yep, David is, uh, David is on task. David is on task, thank you, David. So we have a 15-minute space now, where people perhaps to engage with the concept of narrative and It's a great question and my first answer is we've been socialized for the last 200 years to think that this is the only way, that the old way, that the traditional way is the only way. Um, I got quite a bit of flack 20 something years ago when I first introduced the boundaryless career idea and I got that question quite a bit. I get it less because everything we're seeing about the way the world of work is going is still in support of what I was saying 20 odd years ago. Um, and it does provide, I, you're absolutely right, people need to have their own support system. Um, if, you, if you're doing work, you need to be good at it and hopefully get repeat business and referrals from the people that you work with. Reputation matters much more. Um, but I, another part of the answer is, and there's a guy in London whose name I wrote down but I can't reach my pocket right now, but he's running uh, crowd, um, crowd Skills is his company and his point is to match present or recently graduated students with a skill set with small to medium businesses that can't afford to employ anyone full time. And there's a whole slew of work out there that fits that kind of category. You know? 
And where does innovation happen? Mainly small to medium firms. So you can develop an argument that says, really, this is widespread. It's not something that um, is, is sort of a threat to our traditional way of thinking. Rather, it's getting to the point that, well, who, what's the elephant in the room? Maybe it's the full-time job, you know? Um, but I, I, you know, I, and the more I've poked away at this freelancing thing, I've had more time recently, and the people that are, you know, they're fine, they've been to college, or one, you know, in one case she'd been to community college, but she became something of a programmer. She got pregnant and she said, you know, by the time I'm, I have this child, I can be a, a fully qualified sales force supporter, technician. And she did all that and she got her first contract through a company called Flex Jobs that was scouring the market for flexible employment. And then after that it just took off. The, she, you know, people called her first company and said, how did she do? They said she was great and it just took off and she's, she's turning down work that she can't get to. As a, you know, having found this nice little niche where there's a lot of demand for someone who can come in, help a company for a relatively short period of time and then go on to another project. That's a good question. <laughs> Maybe, the, you know, you go at the pubs and they're not half empty because of the, the, the economy's down. But that's, you know, because there's a flow of money coming in from outside Hartlepool. So maybe, you know, I don't know whether people are desperate enough to, to give up on the old culture, but I, you know, I'm sure there are, there are trends in that direction. Hartlepool is on the web as well, you know. And it does have a, you know, there is a Hartlepool Technical School. I think it might have university status now. Yes? Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, oh, sorry. Whoa, whoa. Uh, yes? Thank you for your work. Uh, the opening paragraph of my dissertation referenced your book. So thank you uh, for that thing in that way. I've been on for this group. And I want to ask for, you know, I lead a grad program for my master's students who are stepping into jobs. What language or behaviors, what do you recommend for them stepping into this probably more freelance economy? Should we approach it or equip them differently in this economy? No, I recommend the intelligent career card sort for you to help them be, come out better prepared. <laughs> no, seriously. Peer coaching, you give it to them, you watch them interview each other. Um, I have had success with it and I've done it with undergrads and they have to be serious about their work. If they're there to play baseball, it, you'd probably struggle more, but if they're serious about their work, it's work, it works fine. And you say, I'm not here to help you find your first job, I'm here to help you look five years ahead. And then they develop a much richer story that is still beneficial in their first interview. No, I know, I hear you. No, I hear you. But I'm genuinely interested. Do you see any risk? I haven't seen the Obama Branson interview. Yeah, but I mean, one risk is that the trade unions are still stuck in the past. You know, if the trade unions listen to their workers, their workers have families. Their workers need flexible, you know. I would have thought the progressive trade union should be on top of this. Not dragging its feet. You know, not, not conveying traditional messages about employment. I mean, one of the things that the trade union movements, in my view, is to, is to rail against markets which I think are very, very helpful for, pe 
for people to find their own way through life. It seems to me we can do better than, than, than you know, say markets that are terrible. Um, so I, I, I want to, con I mean, I love the Freelancers Union, which was formed in New York by a woman who was the daughter of a labor lawyer. So, I mean, I do think there are examples where unions can sort of pick up and run with a different ball. But, but my piece is sort of just to look at the person and, and to join that conversation because I understand where you're coming from and I understand the importance and I think it's very sad if we create a situation where social gains that have been made through one set of assumptions get lost because we don't keep pace and engage with a fresh set of phenomena which I would argue are pretty clearly out there. Is that okay? There's, there's clearly, if you, if, you look, if you look at the experience of the majority of workers in Britain, the majority of them are not living in the kind of life you described. If you look at the majority of workers in Kinshasa, they are not living in the kind of work that you're living. They are kind of work living in the kind of um, life that you're describing. It's generally not to their advantage. And there's, there's clearly some relationship between flexibility in an individual Sense, labour law and the strength of the economy. And I think one of the things that, that you, you've got to be careful about is if what you're, you're doing is essentially advocating for privileged people to make different choices, then that's fine. And I don't think anyone would have any problems with that. And that's, that's something that career councils do all the time. If what you're arguing for is that this is a different way of applying the then there needs to be some kind of flip side to that. There needs to be some kind of way in which the, the, the negative, the downsides of that are... No, I, I hear you. I hear you completely. I join you. I mean, I join you com fully in your concern for the, the disadvantaged worker, if you will, or the, 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 the everyday the worker. Is, the everyday worker, yes. I hear you very clearly. And, and I, you know, and I'd want to join that conversation. Um, A lot of, and, and I buy the thing about, you know, flexible, four, well, four day a week is a variant on full time, you know, it's still a full time job kind of argument, isn't it? It's, it's not, it's not why don't our people do a couple of different things and, you know, make it so, so, you know, I'm not sure a four day a week is radical enough to respond to what I see going on, but I, I absolutely join you in saying I, I don't want to lose those gains that were made either and and you know I put up that picture of Donald Trump and I would share with you you know a disappointment about what's going on in America and how that rides roughshod over a lot of practice that's been built up to this point so I, I, I do very much hear you um, the second disclaimer is I'm not a student of labor relations. You know, I look at this from a different point of departure, but I'd love that conversation. You know, I'd love to go further because I am seeing a lot of people that I wouldn't label as privileged making a success of this kind of journey. Rachel Nelkin is a very interesting example. I mean, she says it's pretty common in the performing arts that, you know, you do have to move around, but she's a wonderful example. And the advice to freelancers that was included in her article in The Guardian, I thought was just first class, you know, very, very appreciative of the situation and how a person could, could adapt. Uh, the Freelancers Union in New York I find fascinating because, you know, it's on trade union <laughs> principles, but it sort of says, look, we as our members work together to try and make this, this system work in our favor, and because of our size, we have some bargaining power. 
um, but they, they, they're using it from a point of departure that this is the kind of work that its members do. But I'd love a longer conversation. And I really am with you in terms of not wanting to see those social gains be left behind. Oh. Oh no, no. But what? But uh, you know, I think Michelle Obama's point is if if two people are trying to have serious careers, somewhere along the way, if you, I mean, of course you can do it the other way with with you know babysitters and crushes and and friends and family and so on and making it work absolutely. Um, but the need for flexibility increases if you have two providers working rather than one, that's all. I'm not dis you know, and the point is we need a range of solutions out there, not to, not to project anything on the, like the two career couple at all in terms of being prescriptive about how to solve the issue. It's just that it's more likely with two careers in one household that you're going to need to stretch somehow to sort of make, make that work. Is that, that okay? What about this here? Sorry, um, there's another guy called Guy Standing who actually wrote a few books on the precariat. Yeah. And his analysis goes quite a bit along your ways of thinking. But he actually ends up uh, with a solution which is creating another type of safety net under these, what he calls the precarious, and I think it's close to your concept of freelancers. Mm. He, he introduces the idea of the basic income, the basic, basic citizen income. I wonder if you have mm. any comments on that. I mean, you're trying here, and I think I'm following on some of what Tristan said, how do we create some safety nets in this kind of environment that you're actually describing here? That's a good question. Uh, I've seen the same argument with regard to automation, rise of the robots, and it's the same thing. Um, I have a sympathy for that argument. You know, it would happen in Britain before it happens in America. But absolutely, if the traditional safety nets aren't working, we need to find a better way. We need to find a way to provide new ones. Um, the piece that I push is that the person can be, I mean, I've written a piece recently, Walmart are introducing a whole new series of robots for their stores. And they're saying, no layoffs because all this will mean is our associates will have more time to work with customers. Why they can really make a difference instead of doing the work that was you know, manual and backbreaking, but which previously we didn't have the robots to do for us, right? And my answer was, you know, so they're saying, look, our workers can have more customer contact, they can learn more skills, they can, we have courses on communications and empathy, and they can take a path to branch management and blah, blah, blah. And my answer is, fine, but the robots are only going to really be there for three or four years before that competition catches up and Walmart, and Walmart, if it's going to stay the cost leader, is going to have to do something else. So the risk is of employees coming in with a hope of long-term employment when in reality is employment is only good for the next three or four years. My argument is that if the person thinks within the same time frame as Walmart, they won't be disappointed. Rather, they'll be better positioned themselves to run with technology. Is that? And what I see 
is uh, high qualified young adults, let's say millennials, who are really flexible, who manage their career paths and journeys and whatever they are with a luggage and suitcase and traveling from country to country to find better mm. chances to do the better work and they do so and everything makes sense regarding their career but what I do not see is the balancing between career and time. No. Between career and life. What I hear from them, my own children, my former children, yeah. is we don't have a life actually. Yeah. Why all this? What are we going to do? How one can have a family in this type of life yeah. and flexibility and whatever? They are successful. Mm. Yeah. No, it, well, I mean, I hear, yeah, no, I hear your worry. They might, you know, they might grow out of it and have other preferences. Um, but people stay single longer and have children later, and we have to sort of put up with that. Another, but the thing I, one thing I found, I asked the Flex, Flex Jobs, this American company, for some people to talk to. And I ended up talking to two digital nomads. But in both cases, their partner was with them. And so, I, you know, I always imagined the digital nomad was a sort of a, a loner. But no, this worked because in one case they were, they'd been flooded, their home had been flooded in North Carolina, they said never again. They drive around the country in a camper van and they do the work from wherever they park the van at night. But they're a couple. Got another couple that's over in Thailand now, a digital, digi you know, a digital nomad friendly country. There's a social life already there for them. Again, the work just flows back into the United States and who cares, you know? So there are things that take you down that path. But then at some stage, of course, you want the stability for your kids. And but then you can still, and one of the things that is amazing to me is you can stay in place, you can contribute to the success of a city without living in it. You can do it from Hartlepool. You know, maybe people aren't yet socialized to do it from Hartlepool, but they can. And I think that's fascinating, and, and where can we go with that, you know? Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, can I just say, um, I wanted to thank Michael, of course, very much indeed for sharing his thoughts. And I also wanted to thank the audience for being very um, amenable to the idea of going some way away from smiling. And so we were able to have a whole conversation again about identity and indeed about boundaries. So I appreciate the whole range of responses we had and Michael for gathering them up. It's now half past two. And so we're going to be moving off into the workshops. And just a little reminder that there will be a prior test at 3.30. But you won't need to go anywhere, so you can carry on enjoying the workshops. So if you'd like that to find yourself to your workshop. And a big thank you to Michael. Thank you.